I think, yes, you know, if we're wanting to produce great art, great art is ultimately consumed with great questions and great explorations of just this profound wonder and mystery of what it means to be human in this world. This is the Hillsong Creative Podcast, where we hear from creative experts, influencers, dreamers, and doers, what they've learned and what we can learn from their journey as we explore, respond, and create. In today's episode, we interview Duncan Corby, the academic dean of Hillsong College. He has a master's in theology and a passion for worship in the church. Let's jump straight into this interview with Rich Langton and Duncan. So thanks for coming and meeting with thanks, us Rich. and chatting with us today. It's pretty great to be able to take some time out and talk creativity with you. If I was to sum up who Duncan Corby is in a sentence, what would I say? You could, I suppose you could say that Duncan Corby is this person who used to be an atheist scientist who had an encounter with God and has realised that he is a believing thinker and philosopher with a secret yearning to be an artist. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. So someone who used to be an atheist. Yep. How long has it been since that's changed? I'm 53 now, 54 in a few days. Uh, I became a Christian as an 18-year-old first-year science student at the University of Sydney. Um, But I'd spent my teenage years as an atheist and because I believed that there wasn't a God and I believed that the purely scientific view of the world was the explanation of the world. And so that worked fine until I had an encounter with Jesus in what is now the city campus for Hillsong Church here in Australia and um, uh, realised that the world was much larger, more wonderful, more mysterious, much richer and deeper Mm. and satisfying uh, than the scientific worldview enabled me to uh, consider. What do you think made, made you think that way to begin with? Look, I think I was a product of my generation. I grew up in the 70s, uh, the early 80s, where you had Star Trek, you had Star Wars. Science fiction was really coming into its own. Mm. And so by contrast to all of the things that science fiction and science itself seemed to promise for the future, uh, human history, which seemed to be steeped in religion and superstition and fairy tales, Mm -hmm. seemed to be backward and having nothing to really offer to a, a modern a modern world or to someone who wanted to be some, a member of the modern world. Yeah. Um, but you didn't associate the science fiction with fiction or with, with even with imagination? Well, I, I, no, I did. You know, I, I, I certainly didn't watch Star Wars and think, oh, this is real. Right. But at the same time, because it was science fiction and was posited out in the future, I suppose, it, it painted a picture of what the future could be. Right. A future where if you follow the trajectory of of scientific and technological advancement, Mm. you just think, well, the sky's the limit. Why can't we have rockets that go to the stars? Why can't we have all the things that science fiction depicts? Mm. And if you wanted to imagine a future for humanity, surely a future like that is the best one that you could imagine. Right. And at that point, your understanding of the church or understanding of, of the Bible or faith didn't allow for that? That wasn't the worldview you had? No, it was the, it just, yeah, my worldview at the time didn't allow for that. And, and frankly, most of the Christians that I'd met in my teenage years were probably fairly nominal and their grasp on what Christianity was about mm-hmm. was fairly basic and no one was able to present to me a, a vision of what Christianity could be that was beyond the fairy tale, really. Wow. And so then you said you had an encounter with Jesus. Mm. How mm. did that happen? Well, I was at university. I was um, living on campus in a residential college and in my first 
and I'd come down from country New South Wales to go to university and so I was on the lookout for friends and it turned out that some of the friends, the best friends I made in my first year were Christians, <laughs> <laughs> like real Christians, mm-hmm. and they started sharing Jesus with me and those sorts of things. And, of, and of course, I, I resisted their what they were saying, but at the same time, these were Christians who were different than the ones I'd previously encountered. These people clearly believed. Mm. Uh, Jesus and believe that they're having a relationship with Jesus and that that their faith was vital and important to them, which even though I thought they were ridiculous, I couldn't deny it. And you know, just through their, my continued relationships with them and conversations with them, I found myself thinking to myself, all right, I should at least read the Bible and find out what it says. So I remember um, getting my hands on a Bible and starting to read the Gospels and I would read the Gospels a uh, few chapters of them before going to bed at night. Mm-hmm. And as I would lean over to turn my lot, to put the Bible down and turn my light off, I would, I would, every night as I was doing this, I was struck with this sort of realization that this is true. Mm-hmm. The Jesus that I'm reading about in these gospels, it's all true. And especially when I you know, got to the, resur- the crucifixion and resurrection stories, I just found. Um, I found myself believing it <laughs> right <laughs> in wow. ways that just and it totally surprised me <laughs> yeah and then you know big obviously my heart was being softened towards these kind of things and these my friends invited me to church and I came along to uh, what was then Sydney Christian Life Center we were meeting a block off Dar- off um, Oxford Street in Darlinghurst <laughs> so it was pretty wild times back then in the early 80s mm. and I uh, walked into this Pentecostal church and I, I didn't know that such churches even existed yeah you know my experience of church had been the Presbyterian church growing up and the standard kind of traditional churches in mm-hmm. country towns um, and um, I experienced this church and the vibrant faith and passion for Jesus that the people in this church had. And I, and I suppose that my abiding sense that came from that experience was this, if, if Christianity was true, this is what I always thought church should be like. Right. So then fast forward some two decades maybe. Yep. And uh, in that time you've been on staff and pastoring but but teaching mm-hmm. in the Bible college. Yes, yes, for the last 22 years. 22 years, yep. okay. In that time, have you have you completely thrown out that scientific way of thinking now that you have this new Christian way of thinking? No, I haven't. I think I, I still think that science is an incredibly valid and valuable and powerful tool for exploring the natural world and how it works. Mm. You know, it's one of one of humanity's greatest achievements. But I think I've come to realise what science can achieve and what science can't speak into, as in, you know, science can speak into how is it, how does the world, how does the universe as we find ourselves in it work? It can't answer the big questions, which for us as human beings are the most important questions. Not just how is that there a uni- is there a universe, but why is there one at all? Right. Um, you know, what are we as humans? What does it mean for us to be human? Um, my experience of consciousness seems to be, and being a person seems to go beyond what science can explain. Mm. So I've, I suppose I've realised both the power of, of science, but also the limitations, what things it can't explore and mm. what things it can't say meaningful, hmm. let alone true things about because it, it, our questions just go off the scientific map. Yes. But again, like I said, it's those questions which for us as humans are the most important and compelling questions and have been throughout all of human history. Hmm. And it's curious that it's only modern scientific materialist people who've reached the conclusion that those questions are meaningless. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas for the vast majority of human history, they mm. have been the central questions right. and the most human of questions. Mm. So you're obviously widely read and you've studied quite significantly over the years. Mm-hmm. For someone listening who's a, a you know creative, is thinking something that they should really engage in when it comes to their creativity and, and applying, I guess, answers to all those questions in their creativity or is... Are they mutually exclusive? Should our creativity just be full of imagination or...? Well, look, it's, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, 
one of the areas that I have done a lot of reading and, and thinking in is the realm of aesthetics, which is a sub-branch of philosophy. Uh, and I've done that as part of my studies, but I found that it's contributed enormously to my thinking about the Christian faith and a Christian view of what it means to be human, what it means to create art and what art is doing and and all that sort of thing. Because it seems to me that the making of art is one of the most amazingly human things to do. And, and, and I suppose when it comes to thinking and thinking about, say, art particularly, there's two levels on which that thinking can happen. One of them is that we can stop and think about art itself, what, what is art, what is good art, what's bad art, mm. what's going on with art, um, where does the role of the, of the beautiful turn up in art, why, is, why does art have the effect that it has upon us? And, and those are asking all sorts of questions about art. But then there is questions that art itself asks and the answer, and it seems to me that the questions that art asks are again those most fundamental and important human questions. And art has a way of answering those questions, which I think really gets to the guts of the matter, in that if you want to ask the deepest questions about life and experience and existence mm. and being and consciousness, you can try to articulate answers to those questions either philosophically or rationally. But in all that I've read and even my own thinking, I've always feel like the language that you try to use to do that is not up to the task of just talking about what it is you're trying to talk about. They are, they're almost questions that the answers exist beyond the realms of normal language. Right. Whereupon art, both visual art and literary art and, and various other kinds, now give us access to a language which I think is ideally suited to both talking about those questions and also exploring the answers. Mm. But the answers they give are not rational answers. Right. But they are nonetheless answers. Mm -hmm. And I think there has been a long tradition in certainly Western thinking about art and the practice of art is that art and literature and all those great human artistic endeavours and achievements, the thing that gives them such value and significance for us is that they are a means of exploring and providing answers to those biggest questions. Mm. And so I think when you bring that activity, that aesthetic or artistic activity within a Christian worldview, because now we're starting, I think, the Christian worldview opens up a vision of the universe, a vision of existence, a vision of God and a vision of ourselves, which is the, if you will, the right territory in which to be thinking about both the questions and the answers. So mm. thus I think there is incredible power then for Christian artists to really mm. get on the game mm. in, in providing these aesthetic, non-verbal or non-rational answers to the biggest Mm. of questions. We'll get right back to the episode, brought to you by our Hillsong Worship and Creative Conference, which happens in Sydney, Australia, every November. Find out more details at hillsong.com forward slash WCC. Now, let's get back to the episode. This is Duncan Corby, and this is my Fantastic Four. My favourite movie this year has been Blade Runner 2049. My favourite way to recharge is on my lounge with a good book. The title of the current chapter of my life is Deeper Reflection. The last book that I started to read was a book called The Principles of Art by the Oxford philosopher of the 1930s, R.G. Collingwood. How does then the Christian artist, let's say a painter, how do they not just be very literal in conveying then the, the answer is Jesus? Now, that may be needed, but, but is that what you're talking about? Well, uh, no and yes and no. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not talking about the artist producing, if you will, Christian propaganda. No, 
where they turn their artistic arts towards, you know, straightforward or bland or superficial Christian pronouncements. Right. I'm thinking that they ought to do what artists do, which is to try and themselves wrap their minds and their heart and their aesthetic view of the world, try and wrap all of that around the, the, the mystery of God and the mystery of existence, the mystery of God in the world. Yeah. You know, it's easy to say Jesus is the answer, but mm. how is it that Jesus is the answer in the world? Yes. How is he the answer to the question of my own existence? Uh, how does he engage with me as a person? How does Jesus fill my life in this fallen, corrupted, broken world, which is full of evil and suffering and pain, yet still feel it with, with colour and meaning and light, mm -hmm. yet that still anticipates the future and eternity? Mm -hmm. um, and even if I want to propose Jesus as the answer, I recognise that Jesus is the transcendent God in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Which are easy words to say, but yeah. what do they mean? Mm. <laughs> How do you explore the meaning of those words? Because as soon as you start talking about God as the transcendent, self-existing, eternal, uncreated one, mm. I'm using language restricted to a temporal, created, non-self-existent universe to talk about the transcendent. Mm. Well, obviously that language is not up to the job. Yeah. You know, you, we want we want to say things like, God is really big. Mm. Well, yes, God is really big. But bigness is a concept that only makes sense within a created temporal, physical, material universe. Mm. God is transcendent. He is before or beyond there was such a thing. So how does the concept big mm. apply to God? Mm. It doesn't apply at all except perhaps metaphorically. Right. But as soon as you say that, we're automatically into the realm of aesthetics mm. and art in that the language we'd want to use to talk about God, because it is human language and it is language which is a human invention in this created world, is automatically condemned to having to speak metaphorically about the transcendent God. Mm. Yeah. So then <laughs> practically speaking... Mm. What would you say to someone who is who sees themselves as an artist or sees themselves as a creative, let's even put it more broadly than that, when it comes to their thinking, when it comes to the questions they're even grappling with themselves? Oftentimes we, we, we as Christians don't think um, broadly and deeply because we have, I guess, a worldview to live through. So, so therefore we just take the answers that we know to be true and we believe to be true and then we forget about perhaps the questions that people have been asking to get to the answers. Does that make sense? Yes, or yeah. even the, the questions that the answers then trigger. Right. We think, right. oh, I've got the answer. I don't need to ask any more questions. I always go, that's a great answer, but it stimulates all of these further questions for yeah. me. Hmm. And it's as we go down those rabbit holes of the questions that the answers stimulate mm. that we that I think we we end up with a, a a a rich and full vision Christian vision of the world mm. and so you would encourage people to express that the grappling with the answers through their art mm. Mm. yeah and and realizing that the answers that they're providing are not necessarily literal or rational Answers, Not right. that they're meaningless or irrational, but they're expressing answers which go beyond the limits of rational speech. Right. And they <laughs> should be okay with that? Comfortable with not having rational answers? Does you understand what I'm yeah, asking? Yeah, I do. I, I think not that, you know, and not that we can't lend our rational thinking to this and I think mm. this interplay between the aesthetic and the rational is good for both. Um, so I'm not, certainly not encouraging people to stop thinking rationally <laughs> but to continue that, but to create that zone in themselves where there's that interplay between the rational and the aesthetic. Mm. But I think, I think, yes, you know, if we're wanting to produce great art. Great art is ultimately consumed with great questions um, and great explorations of 
just this profound wonder and mystery of what it means to be human in this world mm. that we have come to realise that God has graciously granted us to be in the world that he has made. Mm. Um, and I think to settle for simplistic one or two sentence answers to that question is ultimately to rob ourselves of the deep wonder of what it means to be humans made in the image of this transcendent, self-existing God. It's just, as I said, you start throwing some concepts in there, the territory gets deep really, really quickly. Mm. But at the same time, it gets incredibly rich and I think incredibly satisfying and um, is cultivates a, a, a real sense of, of wonder mm. for us. And, and I think after 20, you know, 22 years as a teacher and 34 years as a Christian, I think the, one, of the, one of the reasons why I'm still a Christian and still a teacher is because I realised that the, the vision of human life and existence that the Christian point of view enables and makes possible is the richest and deepest and most wonder-filled and most satisfying mm. and the one that makes the sense of the totality of human experience, not just the rational and not just the aesthetic and not just the historical mm. and not just the emotional or the spiritual, but it's the one that makes sense, the best sense of all of it, but also opens up the doors mm. to both, not just the, to, to the deepest experience of it and the deepest exploration mm. of it. Yeah. That as, as a Christian, it opens up the possibility of really starting to discover what it means to be humans as God intended us to be. Mm. Amazing. I feel like um, I've just, um, my mind has been a little bit blown <laughs> and it's been wonderful to just stop for a minute in the business of today and just think just even for a second about how um, knowable and unknowable God is and, mm. and the wonder of what that means for us. So thank you for being with us. And, um, My great pleasure. We didn't even get half of, half of where I hoped we might, so we might have to come back and we can talk I'd some be more. I'd more than happy to do that. Yeah. It's certainly been fun. Thanks so much, Duncan. Good on you, Rich. We hope you enjoyed that interview and pray that you're inspired and challenged in your own creativity. Next up is this week's story for the Psalms of Ascent. You can find out more at hillsong.com forward slash WCC and join with us in the 100-Day Creative Challenge. One of the things I love about my job here at church and wherever you may find yourself, I think there's such great encouragement in the fact that we're not striving to build something. We actually get to be a part of what God is doing. Where is God in the paper that I've got to write? Where is God in the meeting that I'm about to host? Um, where is God in you know the stage design I'm about to create? And if we can go, this is God's house, it's amazing what excitement it brings to your job, to wherever you find yourself. Whether you find yourself in the industry, uh, whether you find yourself working at a church, whether you're a tradesman, whether you're a musician, graphic designer. One of my prayers when I come into work is God help me to find what you want in today. And I think it's just being willing to give everything that you have and go, okay, God, this is what I'm doing. Bless it, I believe for your blessing in going home at the end of the day with the satisfaction that you've given it to Him as worship. And I think that that's where the ultimate blessing is in, is in coming um, in submission and bringing what we do as worship to God every single day. I think that's pretty exciting. Well, that's it for today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to subscribe, you can do that on iTunes, YouTube, or SoundCloud. And I'd encourage you to do that so you can be a part of the journey with us. We'd love to hear from you too. So if you want to give us your comments, do that on our Instagram. It's at HillsongWCC. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>